When the last remnants of ISIS in Syria were cornered in a small pocket on the border with Iraq in early 2019, one question was on many people's minds. Was the kidnapped British journalist John Cantley still alive? And if so, would he be rescued when this last Islamic State bastion in Syria would fall to American-backed forces? But wait, why had ISIS allowed the British and non-Muslim journalists to live inside their caliphate when all other captured foreign journalists had either been executed or ransomed off by the terrorist organization? This is the story of John Cantley, the Westerner who was forced by the Islamic State to be their own foreign correspondent, making videos painting the terrorist organization in a positive light in exchange for his life. But before we begin guys, remember to like, comment, share, I also got a Patreon, it's what makes a difference and it truly just helps my channel grow and my videos to be promoted. This remarkable story starts on July 19th, 2012 on the Syrian-Turkish border when journalists John Cantley and Jerome Orlsman were captured by jihadists while trying to cross into Syria illegally to cover the country's brutal civil war. Instead of uh, being picked up by free Syrian army guys, we were delivered uh, by mistake into the hands of Islamic jihadists. None of them were Syrian. Uh, looking around, they were um, of Pakistani origin, Bangladeshi, Chechnyan, anything but Syrian. Um, initially, they said we, they just wanted to check our IDs, that we really were journalists, and they'd let us on our, on our way. But one night, uh, first night uh, that we crossed, we were handcuffed. The next day we were handcuffed all day. They took all our goods. And from there, it was pretty obvious that it was only gonna go downhill. During the capture, Cantley was shot while trying to escape, later stating to the British tabloid, The Sun, it's every Englishman's duty to try and escape if captured. After being shot, he also stated that he could hear several British-born Muslim jihadists shouting, die Kafir, Kafir being a very demeaning term for non-Muslims. Cantley was then taken back to the jihadist HQ where he was treated by a jihadist claiming to be a British NHS doctor. Thankfully, on the 26th of July, the pair was rescued by another rebel faction just days before they were supposed to be handed over to Al-Qaeda. The two journalists had been treated so badly during their incarceration that neither could even walk, and John Cantley was suffering from nerve damage in his hand as a result of him being shot, Orlsman later stating that especially the British-born jihadists were especially vindictive towards their prisoners. After having been rescued, the pair both returned to Europe. However, sadly, Orlsman died in 2016 from a sniper's bullet while covering the Libyan army's fight against ISIS in the Libyan city of Sirte. Now, you would think that a traumatizing experience like what Cantley experienced in Syria that left not only permanent mental but also physical scars on Cantley would have made him very reluctant to return to the war-ravaged nation. But in fact, this had already been John Cantley's second tour in Syria. During his first tour, he had already witnessed people being killed by shrapnel right in front of him. So in November 2012, Cantley returned to Syria with fellow journalist and friend James Foley, a name I'm sure many of you are already sadly way too familiar with, to shoot a documentary about Cantley's first kidnapping. However, the pair ended up getting kidnapped again while shooting this documentary inside of Syria, but this time by another somewhat obscure group at the time named the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, otherwise known as ISIS. In 2012, ISIS, while mainly unknown to the Western public, had already established a reputation inside of Iraq and Syria as the most hardline Salafist rebel group who was both effective and disciplined on the battlefield, media savvy and incredibly brutal against prisoners, especially non-Sunni Muslim prisoners like James Foley and John Cantley. John Cantley was then incarcerated in an ISIS prison for foreigners the group had captured. These foreigners included aid workers and journalists and they were all guarded 24-7 by a group of British-born jihadists nicknamed the Beatles by the British media. This group included Muhammad Mwazi, who would later be known as Jihadi John. However, despite having officially converted to Islam in hopes of receiving better treatment, John Cantley and his fellow Westerners were treated appallingly by the British-born ISIS fighters, for example, shooting at them with BB guns, committing mock executions, and beating the prisoners relentlessly. When ISIS then announced their jihad against, well, literally everyone who had not already given baya to their caliph, Emir al muhminin Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi al Qurayshi, blah, 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 blah. The terrorist group, known for its high-quality English language propaganda videos, started executing their American and British prisoners on camera, starting with James Foley, Cantley's cellmate and longtime friend. Then afterwards, the terrorist group executed American-Israeli Stephen Sotlov and then David Haynes, an actual British taxi driver who had gone to Syria to be an aid worker. You can't possibly stoop lower than executing aid workers who went to your country to aid impoverished war victims. It must have been absolutely terrifying and psychological 
psychologically damaging for John Cantley to watch all of his fellow prisoners and friends being executed around him. But because of his ingenuity, intelligence, and luck, he alone had managed to got, have gotten on better terms with his captors, who somehow decided to give him, and specifically only him, a chance at proving his own worth, and it's likely he would also be executed if not deemed more valuable alive. Cantley started by writing articles in the Dabig magazine, an English language publication published by the Islamic State made to compete with Al-Qaeda's own Inspire magazine. Dabig encourages ISIS supporters to either commit attacks in their country of residence or join ISIS in Iraq, Syria, or somewhere else that the terrorist group is also located. In one Dabig article attributed to Cantley, Cantley expressed frustration about the fact that 15 European hostages had been ransomed off by different European governments and gone home to their loved ones, while he and the other Brits and Americans had been left to die by their own governments, writing, knowing that they were going to be killed, what does that do to a man? Cantley also referenced his already executed friend James Foley in ISIS's own magazine by writing, we'd come all this way, putting one foot in front of the other, supporting one another when it got tough. When it got really hard, he remembered him and Foley used to call it the death zone in reference to the final stretches of the Mount Everest climb where there's not even enough oxygen to breathe. When every step is agony and when they hardly even have enough strength to carry on, this wording was very significant because if John Cantley was to survive his current predicament, he he too would require absolutely superhuman strength. Thankfully for Cantley's health, the articles proved so popular among Dabig's readers that Cantley was promoted in the Islamic State media apparatus from print media to making video appearances. John Cantley first appeared on video wearing Islamic State's notorious orange jumpsuits in the miniseries Lend Me Your Ears, messages from a British detainee. Hello, my name is John Cantley. I'm a British journalist who used to work for some of the bigger newspapers and magazines in the UK, including the Sunday Times, the Sun, and the Sunday Telegraph. In November 2012, I came to Syria, where I was subsequently captured by the Islamic State. Now, nearly two years later, many things have changed, including the expansion of the Islamic State to include large areas of eastern Syria and western Iraq. The Lend Me Your Ear series always starts with John Cantley reiterating that he is a British citizen and he has been abandoned by his own government since ISIS obviously want to emphasize the fact that they believe that the British government doesn't care about its own citizens. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking he's only doing this because he's a prisoner. He's got a gun at his head and he's being forced to do this. Right? Well, it's true. I am a prisoner. That I cannot deny. But seeing as I've been abandoned by my government and my fate now lies in the hands of the Islamic State, I have nothing to lose. Maybe I will live and maybe I will die. But I want to take this opportunity to convey some facts that you can verify. Facts that, if you contemplate, might help preserving lives. The actual content of Lend Me Your Ears is almost exclusively John Cantley himself talking about several different things, sometimes talking about his own experiences and situation, which is obviously incredibly sad. Certainly the executions of my three previous cellmates, most recently Britain David Haynes, shocked the public and will have made everyone sit up and take notice. The Islamic State say that the deaths are retaliations for the airstrikes, which by now have killed a handful of Mujahideen and their families. This is in response to your aggression, they say. But the killings are, rather unfortunately for us, exactly the sort of thing our governments need to bolster public support. People don't understand geopolitics, but a man having his head cut off? That's worth making a noise about. The public will respond in one of two ways. They'll either demand an end to this cycle of bloodshed and say, what are we doing back there? Let's get out. Or they'll demand revenge and support more military action. Our governments would already have known this, and it's entirely possible we were left behind for exactly this purpose. I'm horrified if this is the real reason, but apologies to Tom Friedman if I'm overreacting. 
but mainly educating the viewers about geopolitical topics through a pro-Islamic state lens, which is certainly interesting, and he actually comes with some far more sensible proposals to solving the problem of terrorism in Europe than anything the European governments themselves could come up with. But if you're truly worried about national security, you close your borders to prevent people getting in. It's relatively simple and inexpensive and guaranteed to be more effective than another military in intervention in Muslim lands. Keeping people who wish you harm out of your country is much easier than going to theirs. But since this is an Islamic terrorist organization that believes some incredibly kooky conspiracy theories that would put Alex Jones to shame, lend me your ears also spews grandiose statements about how despite practically fighting the entire world, the Islamic State will never be defeated. The Islamic State will survive and even thrive. In the face of setbacks, war only makes the jihadist movement stronger. And they are dug in for the fight. They have years of experience fighting against the Americans and know how to patiently and violently outlast long-term war projects. Lend Me Your Ears also talks about Iranian, Israeli, American plots to destroy the glorious Islamic Din and Ummah. And I must say, like, this is, this is ridiculous. It's like, if you know anything about geopolitics, you know this is bad and most of their general takes in this have aged very badly. I mean, considering that like literally the propaganda narrator in most of their videos is now in like, he's, he, was some, he is some Canadian Somali guy and he is uh, currently enjoying a like 10 times life sentence uh, stay in some American supermax prison. It's, uh, yeah, what a surprise. The Lend Me Your Ear series also includes quite a bit of black comedy from Cantley's side. Giving the FSA 500 million now is a completely pointless exercise, never mind the fact that the FSA sells the weapons the West gives them to arms dealers and smugglers, and much of it then ends up with the Islamic State. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, he's only doing this because he's a prisoner. He's got a gun at his head, and he's being forced to do this, right? Well, it's true. This was honestly quite interesting for me since this is completely unseen in Islamic State propaganda. Their videos usually rely on themes like heroic sacrifice, revenge, and how utopian life is under Sharia law, but never, ever comedy of any sort. On that note, a thing that is also very important to remember is that no one except for Cantley and his abductors know how much of what Cantley is saying is actually what Cantley believes. Personally, I believe that some of the more sober geopolitical parts are likely Cantley's own words, but that he is also likely reading a script which has been created in collaboration with his captors, who made him add some pretty crazy conspiracy theories and parts blaming his own government exclusively for the deaths of his friends. But hold on a minute, Prime Minister. You've known about our situation for nearly two years. You chose not to enter negotiations with the Islamic State that might have got us out. And now you want to use these deaths to fan the flames of this war? If that is the case, then I deeply resent it, Prime Minister. Thanks a lot. Here, Cantley himself most likely knows that what he is saying doesn't make much sense, considering that it was not the British government that executed his friends, but instead the Islamic State. The British government, in fact, told any and all Brits to stay far away, and they still do that to this day. And this isn't purely my own speculation either. Cantley's own sister told the Sunday Times that Cantley likely believes at least two-thirds of what he's saying. Islamic State's own narrative also contradicts itself with regards to the whole left for dead by their own government's narrative, because in the last episode of the series, Cantley talks about a failed Western raid to free the hostages. In this program, I'll tell you about a failed raid to rescue us and how it feels to be left for dead by your own government. On July the 4th, Independence Day, the Americans did try to get us out of prison. Not by negotiation or prisoner exchange, but by an incredibly complex, risky and expensive rescue attempt that failed. The raid involved two dozen Delta Force commandos, several Black Hawk helicopters, gunships, Predator drones, F-18 Hornet jets and refueling aircraft. It took weeks of rehearsals and must have cost tens of millions to perform. But we weren't there. The Islamic State, anticipating such a move, just put the six of us into cars and moved us to another prison days beforehand. Total cost to them was a few dollars in petrol. We're not sure if we missed them by 12 minutes or 12 hours, said Hector Pocock, a special operations spokesman. 
Missions like this are very risky because if they go wrong, you don't know how it'll affect the hostages further up the road. You don't say. I can only imagine how incredibly saddening and frustrating this must have been for Cantley and his family, having come so close to being rescued. But again, this does show that despite their many, many faults, the Western governments didn't actually abandon their own citizens. But in fact, according to Islamic State themselves, likely spent a huge amount of money and effort on trying to rescue John Cantley and the other Westerners. This won't be the last time that the Islamic State propaganda machine, despite its high production values, falls short in the reality department, and this will soon become evident yet again in Cantley's next video appearance. While the Islamic State had been forcing John Cantley to record new videos, the situation on the ground in Syria had been changing fast. Throughout the late summer of 2014, Islamic State had been making huge military gains in Syria against all factions. The reason for this was because of its increased recruitment among foreigners and many, many other reasons. But at the same time, Islamic State was also under increasing pressure since the mandatory Western bombing campaign against the group had already begun, and contrary to its own propaganda, the bombing campaign was already taking its toll on the organization. Therefore, the organization needed a new both strategic and morale boosting victory, and that came in the shape of the little Syrian Kurdish town officially known as Ain al-Arab, but locally in Kurdish and more famously known as Kobane. Kobane has been pounded again today by American bombers and Islamic State suicide attacks. Enter that city of Kobani. I saw in Kurdish forces continue their battle over Kobani. The U.S. military says it dropped arms and ammunition for Kurdish fighters in the Syrian city of Kobani. It says You're looking at what appears to be a massive ISIS car bomb blowing up in the Syrian town of Kobani. Kobani being a position where they cannot survive. Because of its status as one of the last Kurdish controlled areas of the country, Islamic State's siege of the town had garnered large levels of international media attention. Therefore, Islamic State, sure of its coming conquest of Kobane, focused all of its own cinematic propaganda efforts on this mission, and this is where John Cantley again enters the frame. You see, almost all of Islamic State's propaganda was Arab language videos primarily being watched by supporters and potential recruits, but as shown by the Lend Me Your Ears miniseries, the media office of the organization wanted to counter the Western narrative, and for that they needed not only an English speaker, but an English speaker whose appearances would generate news articles in the West. Thus, inside, the next Islamic State series starring its own captive John Cantley was born, with its first episode being Inside Ain al-Islam, its own new Islamic name for the town. Hello, I'm John Cantley, and today we're in the city of Kobani on the Syrian-Turkish border. That is, in fact, Turkey right behind me, and we are here in the heart of the so-called PKK safe zone, which is now controlled entirely by the Islamic State. Now, the Western media, and I can't see any of their journalists here in the city of Kobani, have been saying recently that the Islamic State are on the retreat. In the last 48 hours, hundreds of Islamic State militants have been reportedly killed in airstrikes, said the IB Times on the 16th of October. Good old John Kerry doesn't seem to think the Mujahideen are retreating. He called Kobani a horrible example of the unwillingness of people to help those who are fighting the Islamic State. Uh, that's a dig at Kurd-hating Turkish President Erdogan. But the point is, from where I'm standing right now, I can see large swathes of the city. I can even see the Turkish flag behind me. And all I've seen here in the city of Kobani is Mujahideen. There are no YPG, PKK or Peshmerga in sight, just a large number of Islamic State Mujahideen. And they are definitely not on the run. Now, airstrikes did prevent some groups of Mujahideen from using their tanks and heavy armor as they'd have liked. So they're entering the city and using light weapons instead, going house to house. Now, America is very keen for Kobani to become a symbol, a symbol of victory of the coalition that is working together to defeat the Islamic State. 
But they know, and the Mujahideen also know, that even with all their air power and all the proxy troops on the ground, even this is not enough to defeat the Islamic State here in Kobani and elsewhere. But the battle for Kobani is coming to an end. The Mujahideen are just mopping up now, street to street and building to building. You can occasionally hear sporadic gunfire in the background as a result of those operations. But contrary to what the Western media would have you believe, it is not an all-out battle here now. It is nearly over. As you can hear, it is very quiet, just occasional gunfire. Contrary to media reports, the fighting in Kobani is nearly over. It's quite telling that almost everything he says in the video turned out to be false. Firstly, the Islamic State didn't capture the town. Secondly, Islamic State's failure to capture the town ended up being just the turning point against the Islamic State that the video claimed it wouldn't be. Thirdly, despite Islamic State claiming that their soldiers remained resilient against the Western bombing campaign, the Battle of Kobane actually ended up proving incredibly costly for the group, making them lose large parts of their most experienced forces. It truly boggles my mind what was actually going on behind the cameras at this point. Did they feed John Candley? well? Did they treat him okay? Did they have like normal small talk? I really wonder what the hell was going on behind the camera and I truly hope that one day we can have all these questions answered. This episode also features yet another black comedy moment when referencing the US accidentally parachuting supply crates to the Islamic State. Kobani is now being reinforced by Iraqi Kurds who are coming in through Turkey while the Mujahideen are being resupplied by the hopeless United States Air Force who parachuted two crates of weapons and ammunition straight into the outstretched arms of the Mujahideen. Islamic State now had its very own professional English language war correspondent. According to one article by GQ magazine, this first inside video was a huge hit among the organization's supporters and gained the hostage John Cantley a newfound celebrity status within the Islamic State. And this definitely worked in John Cantley's favor, with one European former hostage speculating that this is likely what John Cantley was hoping for since it would make him more valuable to them, thus significantly lowering the chance of them also killing him. Two months later, Cantley would reappear not in Syria but in Iraq for the second episode of Inside with Inside Mosul, a video that focuses entirely on trying to portray the Islamic State as a just and functional society. Hello, I'm John Cantley and today we're on top of the world in Mosul, overlooking the second largest city in Iraq and under the complete control of the Islamic State for over five months. The media likes to paint a picture of life in the Islamic State as depressed, people walking around as subjugated citizens uh, in chains and beaten down by strict totalitarian rule. Uh, but really, apart from some rather chilly but very sunny December weather, uh, life here in Mosul uh, is business as usual. What I can see is thousands of people thousands of Iraqis going about their daily business here in Mosul after years of oppression under Saddam's rule and the descent into chaos that followed the American invasion. Sunni Muslims can now walk on the streets of Mosul without fear of Shia oppression. No visit to a Muslim country would be complete without doing some shopping at a souk. The bustling, crazy markets where you can buy anything from books to lighters, to perfumes, to bags. And everywhere you look, everywhere you come here in this old, old souk, it's one of the oldest in Mosul, uh, I'm struck by just how whoop, normal and crazy and busy everything is. This is not a city living in fear, as the Western media would have you believe. This is just a normal city going about its daily business. Cantley also shows the very sad reality of war here that is often overlooked in war videos, the many civilian casualties that often outweigh the military ones. Now this wing of the hospital is a special children's unit uh, for pediatric problems with kids who need special medicines. And the room we're about to go into 
is for children with psychiatric problems is a direct result of bombs and explosions uh, falling from above. Come into this room with me. Now I have to talk quite quietly uh, because these kids, as I say, uh, are very adverse to loud noises because of the explosions. Um, but as you can see, they're very young. Uh, the mother's here and they're clearly not happy. Um, but despite all this, there is plenty of electricity. Uh, we spoke to one of the doctors earlier and he told us they are getting the medicines that they need. So despite the bombs that are raining down, and we're told that just two days ago, an ambulance was hit by a bomb. This video also contains the blackest comedy moment in all of John Cantley's videos when John Cantley is signaling a US drone flying above Mosul. Drone! Down here! Over here! Drop a bomb! You gotta rescue me again! Do something! Useless! Absolutely useless! I think John Cantley must have felt very strange, first being abused and forced to read statements, then afterwards being a war reporter, and now at least on camera, travel vlogger, living the life in such a short period of time. But I'm sure if we were in his position, we certainly would not be complaining. Playing in the background is a screen. This is a media place here in Mosul showing me reporting from Kobani. And now here I am on the streets of Mosul. It just goes to show the stretch of the territory of the Islamic State hold all the way from Kobani, and there I am in the background, all the way here in Mosul, and here I am on the streets. That was me then, and this is me now. The next time we see John Canley is in February 2015, just weeks after the Islamic State had burned a Jordanian pilot in another one of their propaganda videos. This new John Canley video named Inside Halab takes place around the Syrian city of Aleppo and is like the Mosul video, less about fighting and more about proving how stable and prosperous life is in the Islamic State. The advance and stretch of the Islamic State is in fact remarkable and breathtaking. Agriculture is a key driver here in Halib. Tilled land stretches as far as the eye can see, sown to feed not just the people of Halib, but also its thriving economy. Grain silos are packed to the rafters with wheat reserves, which are then bagged and delivered at bottom low prices. Livestock leisurely graze on the lush green grass, a beautiful beginning to a delicious end here in Halab's vibrant and colorful markets. This focus on painting life in the Islamic State nicely was likely part of a larger ISIS recruitment campaign which aimed to recruit foreign families to join ISIS because it would likely be very reassuring for possible jihadists to know that their families would be comfortable while they themselves were on the front line. Despite all this destruction, Halab remains a place of serenity and surreal beauty. The Mujahideen are not phased by the bombings at all and continue to conduct classes on the banks of the Euphrates River, or maybe a little fishing, or just enjoying a relaxing cup of tea back in town. And despite the bombings we just saw, people are still getting on with it. They continue to build new dwellings out of this gorgeous white stone that Halab is so famous for. This video also features yet another crazy conspiracy theory, this time that the Syrian army collaborates with American drones to bomb ISIS, which if you know anything, anything about geopolitics, you know how ridiculous that is. We're in the middle here of the market, which is a completely civilian area, and there's just been a large bomb strike on that building behind me. We heard the explosion, we were just about five minutes over that way. The fire brigade, the Islamic State fire brigade are here trying to clear up the mess but it's absolute pandemonium. And all this follows a drone which we saw five minutes ago, and then Assad's Air Force comes in and drops bombs on the market. Now, as far as I know, the Syrian Air Force does not have drones. That must have been an American drone, but that was definitely Assad's bomb dropping here on the market. So, what's going on? Someone is working with someone around here to drop bombs. This is also the last time we see John Cantley for a while, and when he finally returns, he will have become almost unrecognizable. However, we know several things happened to John Cantley after this video. Firstly, in November 2015, Mohammed Mwazi, better known as Jihadi John, was killed by an American drone. This is likely very relevant to John Cantley because firstly, he was the one who executed all of John Cantley's friends and cellmates. And 
secondly, because it is said that he often traveled with John Cantley during his videos. It's, it's crazy to think you'd be stuck working with the guy who murdered your friends. Secondly, in a Davig article attributed to John Cantley, he renounces his relationship with his former girlfriend and writes, quote, whom I hope now has long since forgotten about me and moved on. Thirdly, John Cantley's health deteriorated drastically, which becomes very evident in his next video. It is completely unknown why, but it is likely either sustained from some kind of wound, maybe from a drone strike, maybe even the same one that killed Jihadi John, or because he maybe even had a falling out with the terrorist group and tried to escape. But whatever the reason for his health's deterioration was, it likely contributed to the sudden break in video productions. Fourthly, Islamic State was starting to lose territory fast, which meant that Mosul, the capital of the Islamic State, now was under siege by Iraqi forces. The siege of Mosul was actually the largest urban combat operation in the 21st century to this date, and it was in the middle of this siege in 2016 that John Cantley again would reappear on video, but this time again in a very altered state. Hello, I'm John Cantley, and today we're in Mosul in Iraq. As the war between the Islamic State and the US-led coalition continues, the Americans have launched a surprising new tactic against the Mujahideen. Using their $30 million F-18s and $100,000 missile systems, they've begun targeting not tanks, not trucks, not even the Mujahideen, but Islamic State media kiosks. Unlike his previous videos, this first video is of far lower quality with the audio being distorted to the point of inaudibility. Despite it being a year since we last saw John Cantley, he doesn't mention anything about himself in the video, but I think the visible state of him says it all. And honestly, I'm pretty sure that the only reason why he wears that specific jacket is to hide whatever happened to him. Yet another video was then uploaded shortly thereafter, where he, like the first video, also only reports on the humanitarian situation inside of Mosul and paints it in a pro-Islamic state light. A little footnote, by the way, the reason why these two videos are so different in comparison to the rest of his videos is because they were uploaded by the Islamic State controlled AMAC news agency whose production values and general style is far more basic than Al Hayat Media Center, the foreign language IS Media Center that produced all of John Cantley's previous videos. And I really have no idea why he suddenly appeared on AMAC. But his last ever media appearance would be in neither of these outlets, but rather as a feature in one of the largest traditional Islamic State media releases during the Battle of Mosul. This last appearance is in the combat video called Tank Hunters, and the first part of the video is honestly quite unsettling. On the screen in front of me is an Abrahams tank. It's a marvel of modern battlefield technology, powered by a jet turbine engine with a laser stabilized targeting system and composite armor. But the weapon has not yet been built that can kill belief. And since 2004, the Mujahideen have learned how to hunt and kill the Abrahams with increasingly sophisticated weapons. From Molotov cocktails that cost just a few cents to IEDs, SPG-9s, and now the Russian-made Cornet missile system, as a prisoner of the Islamic State, I've witnessed how the Mujahideen have learned how to stop the once mighty Abrahams quite literally in its tracks. The Iraqi army think they're tough because they have access to American weapons. The Abrams tank, Humvees, M4s. They train with American soldiers. They watch movies and they think they're Rambo. But they have no heart. They have no strength. The Muslim who leaves behind his comfortable life, his family, his house, all the trappings of wealth, to come and fight as a Mujahid in the Islamic State, is very different to the cowardly Iraqi soldier. For example, Abu Ikrama left an easy life in Denmark to fight as a Mujahid here in the Islamic State. Because of the language that Cantley uses in this video, one could wonder if he at this point had gotten Stockholm Syndrome and actually joined the group who murdered his friends, or far more likely he was simply just reading off a script and being notoriously vague about his own status, as always. After this, John Cantley is again forced to rehash his role as war correspondent, this time covering the aftermath of an engagement that the Iraqi army lost. Absolutely, on the front line now of the fight here in Mosul, we're in the center of Mosul, uh, a little way east. And behind me, 
It looks like a scene out of a Steven Spielberg film, except this is for real. This was an Iraqi army base here in the center of Mosul. And now you can see behind me is complete destruction. I counted about 18, 25 BMPs destroyed, a load of Humvees, absolute carnage here, absolute carnage. Now speaking with some of the Mujahideen, they say the Iraqi army took the bait. This is exactly what they wanted them to do. They took the bait like a fish that grabs a lure. Okay, the Mujahideen drawn them in to the center here in Mosul, into this base here, the Iraqi army here with all their armored vehicles. You can count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, bulldozer, BMPs, just blown apart like their little plastic toys. Look here. Warning, that's uh, courtesy of the United States, a Hellfire missile which has been dropped in here. This used to be an M16 rifle, but it's not much now. It's not going to do much to anyone now. So we're going to walk down there and get a closer look at some of the stuff down there now. Come with me now and we'll go down there. Come with me, you've got to be careful of your step here. There's a lot of grenades and unexploded ordnance all around. This is the fight for Mosul. Look at this Humvee, just absolutely destroyed. Nothing else left of it, okay? Just burned out. Look at the turret of this BMP. It's just been blown off the BMP like it's a toy. And look at this bulldozer. This bulldozer is still working. This is going to be useful for the Mujahideen. Like I said, this was the as -Salam Hospital. It's literally, it's just there. So there were a few casualties, I believe. Fortunately, I think the Mujahideen got most of the people evacuated out of this area before the fighting started. But I mean, the destruction, the carnage is total. There you go, that's the bulldozer firing up there. If they can keep that thing working, I think it's leaking some coolant out the side, but if they can get that thing fixed, they're gonna need it to clear this area. But all these cars completely smashed. This is one of the BMPs that was destroyed by the anti-tank hunting teams of the Mujahideen. After doing this for three years or longer, they're experts at the art of anti-tank warfare. They draw the vehicles in, draw the vehicles in into a specific point and then pop up around it with their RPGs, SPGs and more and more of the Russian-made Cornet missile system and slam missile after missile into these heavy armoured vehicles. You can see it may be thick armour but look at the turret of this thing, it's just been ripped through like it's a piece of paper. Okay, so there's that many rockets flying into this, here's one of the wheels. Uh, but these things are just destroyed like kids' toys, okay? But this area, I haven't seen war like this for a long time. It's absolutely destroyed. There's still smoke coming out of that BMP there. This is part of the hospital network here. So, oh, here we are. This used to belong to an Iraqi soldier, but uh, I don't think he's going to be needing it now, huh? This is one BMP that hasn't been destroyed. Can of, uh, I think it looks like pistachio nuts there. Big bean food. And uh, helmets complete with radios for the drivers and the gunners. These BMPs might be useful for the Mujahideen to use against the Iraqi army. This one looks pretty new in pretty good condition. The siege of Mosul lasted until July 2017, and many had hoped that the Iraqi army would find John Cantley alive somewhere within the rubble of the old city of Mosul. But strangely enough, not a single trace of him was ever found within the city of Mosul. Many had also hoped and theorized that he would likely be found when the final Islamic State pocket in Syria surrendered in early 2019, but again, there was no trace of him. Meaning that this was the last time we ever see John Cantley alive. No other recordings or verified testimonies about his whereabouts after this recording have ever been confirmed. Leading to two different theories. One is that he either died in Mosul and his body was simply never identified, or that he made it out and is likely still alive. The facts speaking in favor of him having died in Mosul are, in December 2016, the city was already completely surrounded by Iraqi forces. Therefore, it would have been very hard for a non-Iraqi looking guy like Cantley to escape the city unnoticed. 
Also, during the later fighting in Mosul, many buildings were completely leveled, making bodies inside completely unidentifiable, so John Cantley and everyone else who accompanied him at the time maybe just died at the same time, thus making it completely impossible for anyone, including ISIS themselves, to know what actually happened to John Cantley. Also, if John Cantley was alive, he likely would have already been found because he probably would have traveled with media people and stayed in urban areas, not in the deserts of Iraq in Syria, but on the other hand, several facts also speak in favor of him still being alive. It is very much possible that Cantley was smuggled out of Mosul since the battle continued for far longer and ISIS released numerous more videos from Mosul after John Cantley's last release, but none of them ever featured John Cantley in any way, shape, or form. Isn't that strange? Why would ISIS not use John Cantley as a war reporter, showing the extent of civilian suffering created by the siege? Also, when notable people related to the Islamic State die, the organization is usually quick to announce their deaths. Why wouldn't the Islamic State have used John Cantley's death to their own advantage by claiming he'd been killed by a Western airstrike, thus making the West look completely responsible for the death of one of their own? Therefore, as far as Islamic State propaganda is concerned, John Cantley is still not dead. There were speculations about Cantley's possible death in 2017, but again, nothing was ever confirmed and it is very common for Iraqi news to be wrong when announcing IS fatalities. UK Intelligence also reported in 2019 that they are also still hopeful that Cantley is still alive, but this was before the surrender of the last IS pocket in Syria, so who knows now. In reality, the story of John Cantley is a story shrouded in mystery and speculation because of John Cantley's cryptic statements and the Islamic State's own secrecy, but I truly, truly hope that one day John Cantley will reappear safe and sound to clear up any misunderstandings and questions we have about his time captured by the Islamic State. State. Honestly, this story is ripe for a movie adaptation and who knows where this case will go next. Many IS prisoner trials are still ongoing, so maybe they have something to add. Plus, the group still controls large parts of the Syrian desert and the Iraqi desert, so maybe he really still is hiding out there. But to be more realistic, the most likely situation is that he is dead. But even then, some final answers would be amazing, especially for his family who until this day knows as little as us and dude that almost fuck that must really be a burden to carry i'm not gonna lie oh i got all of i almost got emotional there <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching the video if you enjoy my content subscribe to me on patreon and if you can't do that then just like comment share it truly helps me out and it helps you to pr to promote the video it, it really does make a difference in that video until next time um i don't know guys <laughs> see ya Thank you guys so much for watching the video. Again, consider donating on Patreon. Everything goes a long way and is a great help because making these videos take a considerable amount of time and effort. I hope everyone has a wonderful day or night and remember, share the video everywhere you can. See you soon.